But if you knock me down, I'ma get on up. Top speed when you hit the ground. Just get on up when you get knocked down. Victory. Hey guys, let's uh, give a quick shout out to our family at Victory Midtown. Everybody join us online, Facebook Live, everywhere. <laughs> Greetings from the rest of your family at Victory Hamilton Mill. Wow, so glad to be uh, down here today. We're actually closing out our Overcomer series. Um, if you rewind all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, the, the book of Genesis, that book closes with the Hebrew patriarch Joseph, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Joseph ruling as second in command over the most powerful nation on earth at that time, Egypt. And if you know how the story goes, right? Like Joseph had an amazing Technicolor dream coat, which got him on Broadway. Um, but then God also uses him to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, saves the nation. He's elevated to this high place of leadership. That's how Genesis closes. Exodus, Genesis, Exodus. Exodus begins with all of Joseph's family moving to Egypt, where scripture says that they became exceedingly fruitful, uh, which means they had a lot of babies, and um, they actually populated the land, which is great until scripture says that there arose a Pharaoh to whom Joseph mattered not. In other words, enough time had passed, king, 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 king. Now, eventually this Pharaoh comes up and says, I don't care what Joseph did back in the day for Egypt. All I do, I look around and I see the Hebrews and they have the best stuff, they have the best land, but this is our land. In fact, take all their stuff and make them our slaves. And so it kicks off generational slavery here to the Hebrew people, uh, where basically the Hebrews are making all the Egyptian cities, and they spend day after day, generation after generation, making bricks. Anybody ever had a season of making bricks? Know what I'm talking about? Like feeling like a slave, working your fingers to the bone, dragging yourself to bed every single night, exhausted. Anybody in here know what exhaustion feels like? Okay, I'm in the right place. Um, My most pronounced season of making bricks was August 2010 to December of 2011. Very memorable season in my life and in Summer's life. Um, uh, Summer and I, uh, at that time, had been pastoring Fusion for five years. Uh, At that time, 18 to 30-year-old ministry of the church. If you're not part of Fusion, you need to be a part of Fusion. All right. And uh, we've been doing that for five years. And then God kind of put this transition dream on our heart, and, which kind of kicked off Victory's conversations about a second location. And so uh, she and I hopped in the car, started driving seemingly every side street in Gwinnett County, trying to find a location for another church. And we just couldn't find it until finally we got a phone call from a guy named Phil Carter, who uh, was the pastor of a church called Destiny Church in Beaufort, Georgia. And one thing led to another, uh, and Victory's prayers for a second location married Destiny's prayers for help, and in August of 2010, Victory Hamilton Mill was born, Uh, which is great. You know, Summer and I stepped into the lead pastor role. The only problem was we had no clue what we were doing. That was literally the only problem, completely clueless. And to add insult to injury uh, to a church going through a church merger, we needed to renovate the building. And so four months in, we uprooted the entire church, stuck it in a high school for seven months, uh, went portable so we could renovate the building. And so here we are just kind of stepping into this new environment. And now we're portable, set up and tear down every single week, trying to recruit volunteer teams, trying to lead a staff, trying to deliver messages, trying to grow a church, trying to get a, a heart for community, trying to get people to come in, trying to see the kingdom come in Northeast Atlanta up there. And we're starting to drown just in Victory Hamilton Mill stuff. And did I mention we were still the fusion pastors? And so we got an entirely different group of people 25 miles south here. So we got suburbs and then we got 20 somethings. And so we're like ping pong and back and forth trying to get a heart for two different groups of people, two staffs, two leadership teams, two groups of people, two weekly meetings, two um, much. 
And in the midst of that, I'm still trying to be a husband and I'm still trying to be a father and somewhere in there, God help me, I'm still trying to be a Christian because this is getting really hard. It's getting really hard. And the, the amount of work was one thing, but the fact that I felt like I was failing at all of it was the straw that broke the camel's back, right? And it started just killing me. I was like a zombie walking around. Um, I started having health problems. I, I started grinding my teeth. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just, just my jaw was clenched shut, migraine headaches, insomnia, started gaining weight. It was not good. And it finally found the tipping point. Uh, somewhere there in uh, 2011, I was sitting in an executive team meeting just right down the hill, and Pastor Dennis is right here, and the rest of the executive team is right here, and I'm like right on the edge. Anybody ever been on the edge before? Like, like, like the tears, or like, like right, you ever been there? Like the tears are just like right there, and you're like, nobody look at me. Nobody talks to me. Nobody asks me a question, and we're gonna get through this thing just fine. And I'm sitting there at the table like, I mean, it's just it's like right there, right? And, and the meeting's coming to a close. Everything's going to be fine. And then somebody has the audacity to ask me, hey, Johnson, how's Hamilton Mill doing? Ah! Ah! Like ugly face. I'm not kidding. In front of the people that I respect more than anybody else on the face of the earth. I'm like grown man baby syndrome. <laughs> and I'm just completely losing it because I was done, right? Something had to give. Something had to change. Why? Because I was completely exhausted. Exhausted. I was done. And my season of making bricks lasted for 17 months. The Hebrews were making bricks for 400 years. Generational exhaustion. Generation after generation after generation. But then you know how the story goes, right? God sets them free. God sets them free. He sends in Charlton Heston. <laughs> and let my people go. And he flexes his muscles and miracle after miracle after miracle, God sets the people free from Egypt. And he begins taking them on this amazing journey out of slavery and into the promised land. All right, out of slavery and into the promised land. And along that journey, he gives them the best gift ever. All right, because the best gift that you can give a liberated slave is rest, is rest. And I believe that that's the same journey that the Lord's gonna take us on today, okay, by faith. That even in this world that we live in, we can pull out of slavery to exhaustion. To exhaustion. Listen, anxiety is not your master. Stress is not your master, and your boss is not your master. Exhaustion is not your master, and we're gonna break free of that gravity today, okay? Even in the world that we live in, even in the land that we live in, and here's the hope, all right, that we're clinging on to. And uh, this is the last message in this Overcomer series, okay? So grab a hold of this promise really tightly. First John 5, 4, here it is. Everyone born of God overcomes the world, amen. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, through faith in Jesus, a whole new world opens up to us, right? What used to be impossible is now possible because we belong to a different kingdom. What's impossible with man is possible with God. So what he's trying to say is this, even in the world that we live in, it's possible to overcome exhaustion. Because too many of us, we're beat down, we're beat up, we're stretched thin, right? We're worn down, we're, however you wanna say it, we have anxiety issues, health issues, stress issues, and we're just working ourselves to the bone, working ourselves and we're killing ourselves, but God says it doesn't have to be so, all right? Even in the world that we live in, we can overcome this thing called exhaustion, okay? And the way that we're gonna do that, we're gonna rewind back and we're gonna go on this journey that the Hebrew people uh, went on from slavery to the promised land. Now, if you know the story, it's very interesting. God doesn't take them immediately from slavery to the promised land for several reasons, but one very strategic reason, because God knew this, okay? God knew that he had gotten the people out of Egypt, but it was gonna take a little while to get Egypt out of the people, 
You know what I'm talking about, right? Like God had gotten the people out of slavery, but it was gonna, it's gonna be a completely different thing to get slavery out of the people, right? Like God can get you out of the world, but it takes a little while to get the world out of you. That's the idea here. And so God has to, has to do some strategic things because these people had grown up in generational slavery. Here's what that does. Here's what generational slavery does is that these people were in Egypt and these parents raised their kids and they raised their kids and they raised their kids and they raised their kids to think like Egypt thought. And how many of you know that the ways of Egypt are not the ways of the Lord? I got news for you today. The ways of America are not the ways of the Lord. You're living in Egypt still, all right? You're, you're in a place which may tout land of the free, home of the brave, but how many of you know more people are enslaved here than anywhere else, right? So it's just a different form of slavery. And so what happens is this. We grow up in this, this systematic way of thinking that goes against the way of God. And what God has to do on this journey from slavery to the promised land, he has to reprogram the way that they think. Because how many of you know a slave mentality does not line up with a kingdom mind mentality, right? And that's the journey, okay? And so what God does on this journey from slavery to the promised land, he takes them to what I would call are three strategic rest stops along the way. Three strategic rest stops from slavery to the promised land, okay? And now we're gonna track with the Israelites. Here's the first rest stop. This is so good. First rest stop, here's what we have to learn. We have to learn to trust in God's provision, All right, now here's the deal. Nobody gets excited about that because we all think that we do it. Much easier said than done. Much easier said than done. Here's what happens with, with, here's the context. Here's the the context for the Israelites. Um, They get set free from slavery. Everything's fine until they run out of food, right? How many of you know, everything's great until you go to the pantry and you're like, I'm gonna die, Right? They're in, they're in the, the desert, man. There ain't like a, like a quick trip <laughs> they can swing by. I mean, it, it's desert. And so they start mumbling. They start grumbling to Moses because they're starving, right? Like all the Looney Tunes cartoons, like the big guys are looking like hamburgers, skinny guys looking like hot dogs, right? These guys are starving, starting to eyeball the weak ones. And, and they're, they're mumbling, grumbling, Moses, did you bring us out to the desert to die, man? We could have done this in Egypt. What's the deal? And God hears it and he speaks. Exodus 16, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. That's good, they called it manna. And it says that it tasted like wafers made with honey. I'm pretty good, right? Like God says, I'm gonna make it rain vanilla wafers. Like, I'm, count me in, man. Like, I'll go out and get some of those guys. Tied me over for a while. And so God says, I'm gonna make it rain bread from heaven. And the people, here's the instruction, the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. Now, here's another another little note. In this way, I'm gonna test to see whether or not you're really listening. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. All right, and so let's just kind of note a few key things that God says here, okay? The first thing is this. It was God who miraculously provided the manna. Right? Let's just make it very clear. The Israelites didn't have a farming system, anything like that. Like what happened was they woke up in the morning and there was bread on the ground. It was gone by the end of the day. It was there the next day. God miraculously provided the manna. They had to go get it, but it was God who provided it. All right? Second thing is this. If they gathered too much, it would spoil. If they gather too much, it would spoil. Gather enough for that day. But here's what's happening. God says this, hey, if you creep back into a slavery mentality, right, and you start freaking out about tomorrow, worrying that you're not gonna have enough, and you go out there and start freaking out and gathering everything, right, because that's what poverty mentality is. You gotta hoard it up, because today might be enough, but I'm not sure about tomorrow. That's how a slave thinks. And so I gotta go out there, I gotta get all this, gotta get all this. If you get too much, it's gonna go bad. Remember, Jesus talks about this. He tells us to pray that God would give us today our daily bread. That's manna, trusting God's provision. The third thing is this. On the sixth day, God told them to get twice as much. All right, now this is tricky. This didn't make sense to the, to the people, right? Because God is saying this, hey, for five days, go out and get enough for each day. On the sixth day, get twice as much because I'm not gonna send anything tomorrow. And here in the midst of of a desert, in the midst of liberated slavery, he's trying to begin saying this thing that doesn't make any sense to them. He's saying, hey guys, don't work on the seventh day. Find a day and don't work. That's very interesting to me. 
okay? And what he's trying to do, he's trying to set them free from slavery to fear of lack, to trust that God will provide everything that they need, all right? And here's, here's the truth. Every single one of us has a fear of lack. We do. I don't care if you have $10 million or $10 in the bank account. Like every single one of us has, the, it's just this human thing that we have a fear that we're not gonna have enough. Now here's the problem. The fear uh, the, of lack produces worry, which produces stress, which then says to me, I gotta go out there and I gotta make it happen. Right, I gotta go out there, I gotta do the grind. If it's gonna be, it's up to me, right? And now God's trying to break that off the people and say, listen, you're not slaves anymore. You don't have a slave master who's stealing from you. You have a good father who's blessing you. And you need to learn how to receive God's provision. He said, you need to learn how to receive God's provision. It, listen, he's saying, don't trust in the government. Don't trust in your boss. Don't trust in your parents. Now, God may use different revenue sources to get it to you, but trust that he's the one who's doing the providing, right? Now, some of you are like, oh, sweet, I don't have to work. No, listen, they still had to go. Like, oh, great, the government, ching-ching, right? No, like, God, they didn't wake up in the morning, manna was in their mouth. Oh, bull, bull, bull. No, they had to go out and gather, right? They had to go out and work. But it was God who provided. They received. There's a difference in working for a living and receiving a living. And the difference is exhaustion and not exhaustion based on whether or not you trust that God will provide everything that you need. Okay, here's how the New Testament says it, Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your, say it with me, needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Note the key word here, right? God says he will meet all your needs. He doesn't say he will meet all of your greeds. He'll meet all your needs. He never promises to meet all your greeds. Now, here, here's what happens. Here, here's, here's how life works, okay? Is that, is that this, is, this is true for every single one of us. God provided everything that we needed, right? And we looked down at it and we're like, thank you, Jesus. Then we looked up at the Joneses. <laughs> Why do they have more than I do? Right? And some of you drove into the parking lot today and you're like, why well, does that guy have a nicer car than I do? He must not be a tither. <laughs> right? We get all judgmental on everybody else. Right? Be careful about that. And what, what happens is this. We get in this competition mode because, that's, because we live in Egypt. And everybody's trying to beat everybody else. Right? So, so I look down at what I have. I say, no, no, no. That's not enough. Right, because my kid wants an iPad, and, and, and I, I don't want a car, I want that car. I don't want a house, I want that house, right? And we build bigger, and we buy better, and we gotta have the name brand this, right? And what happens is we go out and we do this, and we go out and we do that, and I know guys who are killing themselves working jobs that are destroying their families to provide for the families that they're destroying. Right, and you know what happened? This is what happens, all right? God provided everything that we could ever need, but you say, no, 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 that's not enough. I gotta have that, I gotta have that, I gotta have that. And what happened was we gathered too much and it spoiled. And it spoiled because we didn't trust in God's provision. We said, God, yeah, you gave me this much, but I'm gonna go out and get some more. And God said, no, that's not how it works. Trust in my provision and you'll never have lack. You'll never have luck. lack. Listen, God will give you everything you need. Maybe it won't be everything you've ever wanted, all right? But like Jesus says, life does not solely consist of the things that you possess, right? We know this, right? Like nobody ever has been on their deathbed, right? Imagine the scene, like boop, 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 and their family's all gathered around. <sighs> <sighs> Closer. There's just one thing I regret. Only one thing I would go back and change. If I could only change one thing, I would have worked more hours at the office so I could have made more money and bought the Mercedes. Like nobody ever in the history of the world has done that. Ever, ever, ever. And why is it that it 
then it all comes into focus at the very end, right? When we actually know it's really important. What if we knew then what we're going to know? What if we know now what we're going to know then? Like, what, 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 how would that change our life, right? Here's how the psalmist says it. This is so great. Psalm 4, 6. He says, why is everybody hungry for more? More, more. They say, more, more. Well, here's the reality. I have God's more than enough. More joy in one ordinary day than they get in all their shopping sprees. In other words, my average day is better than their best days. At day's end, I'm ready for sound sleep. In other words, I'm not exhausted. I'm not in the machine. I'm not killing myself. I'm ready just to put my head on the pillow. Why? Because God, you put my life back together. In other words, I got my eyes on what's really important. You understand this, we understand this, right? That when you dig right beneath the surface, we, we remember that true wealth isn't about what's in our bank account. It's about what's in our heart and what's in our home, right? Right, come on. Listen, I'm wealthy today, not because of what's in my bank account. I'm wealthy, why? Because I'm saved. I'm wealthy because I'm a co-heir with Jesus Christ. I'm wealthy because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm wealthy because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm wealthy because I'm loved extravagantly by a great God. I'm wealthy because I got a wife who loves me and is committed to me. I'm wealthy because I got two amazing sons that it's the privilege of my life to train them up in the way that they should go that as they grow old that they wouldn't depart from the way of the Lord. I'm wealthy because I still have two parents who are in my life. I'm wealthy because I got friends who have my back. I'm wealthy because I get the chance to work a job that not only provides for my needs, but also gives joy to my heart. Like David said, my cup overflows, man. My cup overflows. And if the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I got news for you. If you're wanting today, then you may have wandered off from the good shepherd looking for greener pastures. And if we're ever gonna break the cycle of exhaustion, the first thing we have to do, we have to learn to trust that God will provide everything that I need. Everything that I need, and it will be enough. It will be enough, okay? That's the first rest stop. The second rest stop here is here. Uh, we have to learn the power of saying no. Ooh, everybody just say it with me, no. no. <laughs> Get ready, that's good. All right, let's track with the Israelites. Um, they, they, they make it a little bit further, probably about 10 minutes, and then they start fighting with each other um, because that's what people do. And scripture says that the Moses brought a chair out, sat in it, and he was the judge for the entire nation, one case at a time. So these two guys and these two girls and them and them and them and then and it starts snaking back and starts going, right? And then, then Bill and Jessica get in line because they're always arguing with each other, right? And it's like Friday at, at Six Flags, you know what I'm saying? Like that line, there's no fast pass through this thing, buddy. Like you gotta wait. And what happens is the guys at the end of the line are like, Moses, what the heck, man? What the, what's going on? It's gonna take us forever to get to you, right? And, and what happens, <laughs> this is so good. God sends a gift to Moses. All right, and the gift is uh, Moses' wife's dad, his father-in-law, and his father-in-law comes to see Moses. Now, you'll have to forgive me. I think that certain things in the Bible are hilarious, and they might not be, but they are to me. All right, uh, because <laughs> I've always thought this was absolutely hilarious. Moses' father-in-law's name is Jethro. <laughs> is that Hebrew? Like, come on, think about it. Jethro? How did this dude get from South Alabama to Israel? Jethro? Like Jethro drives up in his 1956 Chevy truck with his overalls, right? And corn cob pipe. Moses on over to Moses, sees him stressing out, sees the line, says, Moses, this ain't good, brother. You got to change all this right here. Something's gonna give. And here's what it is, Exodus 18, 17. He says, what you're doing isn't good. You and these people, you, listen, not just Moses, you and the people who come to you are only gonna wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you, Moses. You can't handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I'm gonna give you some advice, and may God be with you. This is really good advice. We need to have ears to hear. And he says this, 
You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. In other words, Moses, there's some things that as the leader of the nation, only you can do. Only you can do these things. Nobody else can do them, all right? That guy can't do it. That guy can't do it. Listen, you as the leader, you have to do it, okay? But everything else you need to give away. This is good news for us. Listen, you is the parent, you is the boss, you is whoever, okay? There's some things that only you can do. You need to be moving progressively in life to doing what only you can do. And then you need to turn around and give the rest away. All right, that's what, that's what he says. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, and have them serve as judges for the people at all the times. Have them bring the difficult stuff to you, but the simple stuff they can do themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. And if you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strained and all these people will go home satisfied. Get that. Moses, you'll be able to stand the strain and it's gonna be good for the people too. All right, and what God is trying to do here, he's trying to teach Moses the power of saying no. Because here's what happened, right? Moses was a leader. So what do leaders do? They see problems and they wanna fix them. So what Moses does, he sees all the people arguing, right? All these cases, you know, what's, well, that's my dog. No, it's my dog, that's my goat. You know what I'm saying? Like they're arguing, somebody's gotta fix it. And so Moses steps in, he's like, all right, I'll take care of it. And five minutes later, when he sees the line, he's like, whoa, this is too big for me. I can't do all this, right? And he starts getting overwhelmed. And he knows if I keep on doing this thing, I'm gonna go to an early grave. I'm gonna get exhausted. Anybody ever been there before? You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Like at work, somebody says, hey, can somebody go do that? And you go do that. Now all of a sudden, it's your job. You're like, wait, that's not my job. I was just trying to help. Now people are getting frustrated at you for not doing it. You're like, how is this my fault? I was just trying to help, right? That's, that's, that's exactly what happened to Moses. People are getting frustrated at him for just trying to help but he's only one person, he can't do it all. And what God speaks into the middle of that, he says, Moses, you gotta learn. Listen, if you're gonna make it, Moses, you gotta learn the power of saying no. And here's why too many of us are exhausted, is because we've said yes to too much and we've said no to too little. And God right here, listen, he's trying to set us free from slavery to people's expectations. He's trying to set you free from the opinions of other people. Always worried, oh, if I say no, I don't know, I don't think they're gonna like me. What about my job? I don't know about this. And we're exhausting, we're killing ourselves because we're afraid to say no. Let, let me liberate some of you this morning. Some of you in here are serving in five areas of the church because people asked you to and you're killing yourself and you don't even like the church anymore. Like, I don't like this place, I'm doing it. I mean, I'm doing it for Jesus, but I don't even like coming here because all I do is work, right? Because somebody asked you to do it, so you did it. And some of you are like, I don't even know what that feels like because you don't do anything, <laughs> right? Because it's always the 20% who do the 80%, so the 80% can sit on their blessed assurance and do the 20%, right? Here's the, here's the reality. Some of you out there who are doing everything because so, there's somebody who's in the cafe right now and then they're gonna go to the parking lot. Then they're gonna put on an Usher shirt in a few minutes, okay? Listen, if that's you, some of you are laughing. That actually happens, all right? Some of you out there who are killing yourselves, listen, you need to say no so others can say yes. Because some, some of this church needs to feel the pain of things not getting done, all right? Because this whole thing was never about just coming in and observing one person's gifts. It was about equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. All right, listen, some of you need to learn the power of saying no. Some of you have five parties you're gonna go to in the next two weeks and you're dreading all of them, but you're afraid to let anybody down. All right, God's setting you free. God's setting you free at your work. Learning the power of saying no. I'm not talking about being lazy. I'm talking about being healthy. I'm talking about being healthy, okay? But here's the deal, there was still this much work, right, that had to get done, still this much work. And so Moses said, had to learn the power of saying no, but he also had to learn the power of this thing called delegation. Delegation, right, letting other people help, the uh, people who could uh, oversee thousands and fifties and, and, and tens, you know? He had, to, he had to release some of that to other people. Now here's the problem that immediately arose. It was, a, it was a different type of problem, right? No longer were people frustrated, right, at how long it would took. Now they were frustrated that they couldn't meet with Moses. 
Because imagine, you got a problem, all right? There's Bill and there's Moses. Which one do you want to meet with? Moses, right? It's Moses. Now, the problem is Moses says, all right, yeah, I can meet with you in three months. Or there's that guy over there who I trained who is just as good, if not better than me, and he can meet with you today. Fine. <laughs> Go over here and meet with Bill, and you're all angry. Then he solves the problem, and you're like, oh, actually, that really worked. Thanks, Moses. Thanks for setting that up. And, and listen, this, this is, if you're a boss, if, if you run an organization, if you're high up, in your family maybe even, uh, I go through this, Pastor Dennis goes through this, a lot of us go through this sort of thing, that people get frustrated when they ask to meet with me, and I look at my calendar sometimes, and I'm like, man, I would love to, but it's going to be like six to eight weeks, because that's just how my calendar is sometimes, and people are like, <laughs> but you're a pastor, how? And I'm like, yeah, um, this, I didn't download this sermon from like sermon.com, you know what I'm saying? Like I spent time writing this. This didn't just appear, right? And I'm still a father and I'm still a husband. They don't take me out of like a cryogenic vault and just put me on a platform, right? I'm still a person. I'm a Christian. I'm a son of God, right? I actually have a life outside of here just like you, right? And so here's the reality. I spent a lot of time doing things like this. And now there are other pastors and other leaders in this church who don't have to dedicate so much time to something like this. And they have time and are equipped to pastor God's people on a very one-on-one -on -one basis, Okay. And I learned a long time ago that if I was going to make it, if the church was going to be well pastored, and if the church was going to grow, I had to learn the power of saying no. And if you're wherever in your organization, if you're wherever in your family, you're going to have to learn the power of saying no, or else you're not going to make it. You're also not going to make it. Let, let me say this. Um, if you're in, in your work, all right, uh, and you need to, you probably need to go to your boss and say, hey, there's some things that have just kind of been slowly added to my plate over time, I said yes to it because I'm just trying to do it. I don't wanna let anybody down, but listen, it's killing me. I can't, I can't continue doing this. And if they say no, you have to do it all, then you need to say, because here's the deal. Um, I'm gonna, I, I value my life over a paycheck. I value my family over a paycheck. I value Jesus over a paycheck. And I'm gonna go and receive from God somewhere else because I remembered yesterday that I'm not a slave. Some of you in your home, listen, let me, let me talk, because I, I think that, that moms are most guilty of this. Many of you, you work a job, right? Then you come home and you're completely overwhelmed at home. You need to learn the power of delegation in your home. To a husband, to children, your own little workforce, <laughs> right? Come on, they're part of the family too. All right, they, don't, they shouldn't be 15 with pacifiers still in their mouth. Come on, Jesus, right? Come on. Like from, from the time that our children were like, like this big, Summer was training them to help in the house. Like, like they were making their beds, they were emptying the dishwasher. I have a 12-year-old who mows the lawn. Praise Jesus. I have an eight-year-old who takes the trash to the curb. Come on. Because that's what a family does. Because listen, I'm not a slave and neither are you. And like Jethro told Moses, listen, it's better for me and it's better for them, right? Because we, if we're ever gonna break the cycle of exhaustion, we first need to learn how to receive from God and then we need to learn the power of saying no, of saying no. Okay, there's the last rest stop, here it is. We need to learn to say yes to rest. Say yes to rest. On this journey, right, from slavery to the promised land, um, the, the, the most strategic, the best place that God brings them is to the foot of a place called Mount Sinai. And it's there that God gives them the Ten Commandments. And the fourth of the Ten Commandments is the command to Sabbath. Sabbath. And Sabbath is the Hebrew word Shabbat. Shabbat, okay? Here's, here's what Shabbat means. Shabbat means to cease, to abstain, to end, to stop. All right, I'm going to say it again because some of you don't know those words. They're so foreign to you. You're like, kaise, stop. Stop. Everybody just say stop. stop. Okay, now in your heart, take a breath. Whew. 
Israel still observes Shabbat. All right, they do their days a little differently. And so Friday evening to Saturday evening, Saturday, Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, um, the, the entire nation shuts down. Like, shuts down. Everything Jewish shuts down. Like, if you're, if you're thinking, man, I could go for a Coke. Nope. Oh, man, I need some gas. <laughs> you should have thought of that like 10 minutes ago because you're walking now, brother. <laughs> like, it's, it's not going to happen. Like, everything shuts down for an entire day. And some of you are like, that's so un-American. You're right. It's Jewish. <laughs> it's God's way, and it works. All right? And when you read through the Ten Commandments, uh, this command of Shabbat, God is very interesting. God gives more words, God gives more language, more instruction to the Sabbath than to any of the other Ten Commandments. Right? Because I think he knows we're going to have the hardest time with this one. Right? The first one, have no other gods before me. Yeah, I got that. Right? E easier said than done, but I got it. All right? Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Check. Don't murder anybody. Didn't do that one today. Right? You know what I'm saying? Um, but, but then when it comes to the Sabbath and God says, don't work, everybody's like, hmm, tell me exactly what you really mean by that word, don't work. Right? And, and so he actually describes it in two ways, um, once in Exodus and once in Deuteronomy. I want to look at those really quickly. Exodus 20, verse 8. Here's the instruction from God on the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. This is very interesting, all right? God created six days, and what did he call them? Good, right? He looked back and he said, it is good. God made six good days and one holy day. In other words, there's something different about this day called the Sabbath, all right? This isn't a day just like every other day. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In other words, it's not just another day. This day belongs to God. It's a, not just a good day. It's a holy day, and it belongs to God. Here's the instruction. On it, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter. In other words, there's no getting around this. Nor your male or your female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Why? For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on day seven. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. God created for six days, and then what did he do? He rested, right? What day did God create us on? Day six. Here's the question. What's the first thing that we did after we were created? We rested. We rested. And I think what God's trying to do here, he's trying, he's trying to say this, the most important lesson that you need to learn isn't how to do more. Because people are really good at doing more. In fact, what people are really bad at is stopping. Stopping, resting. And he said, this is one day, a Sabbath that's holy to God. On that day, don't do anything. Remember, just like the Hebrews in the desert, on day seven, you don't collect anything. On day six, get twice as much. But there is a day called Shabbat, which means stop, which means stop. I heard this this last week, that uh, God created for six days, and he took the next day off to spend it with us. Because that's the idea of the Sabbath, right? Because we live in a world, right, that applauds you if you kill yourself for your job, right, but mocks you if you take a day off. Um, I heard this term for the first time this last week. Uh, the term was work martyr. Work martyr. Google it, all right? It actually says that 35% of millennials fully embrace and rejoice in the fact that they are killing themselves for their jobs to get ahead, to try and get ahead. A work martyr. We live in a world, and especially a land that says, good job, seven days a week. You're taking a day off, you're a slacker, right? That's because we live in Egypt, all right? But God created for six days, and they rested on the seventh day to turn around and look at it. And here's the big idea of the Sabbath, all right? We Sabbath to stop, to rest, to connect, and to reflect. To stop, to rest, to connect, to reflect. To connect, why? Because it's a Sabbath to the Lord, to the Lord. In other words, I spend that day 
here, what Jesus says, that Jesus says that man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man, okay? So don't get all legalistic on me, all right? Don't say, well, it's gotta be this and it's gotta be that. Listen, the, the Sabbath is not a box for you to fit into. The Sabbath is a blessing, is a present to you all right, to rejoice, to, to, to make life sustainable, all right? So th that Sabbath day, whenever that is for you, because here, here let, me, let me let you in on a little secret. I'm working today. Some of you are like, I don't know what to do with that. All right, tomorrow is my Sabbath, all right? And so find a day, and on that day, you connect back to God, you connect with your family, you connect back to your friends, if, if that's something that the Lord's leading you to do, and then you turn and you reflect, all right, God turned and he said, it is good. What would happen, listen, what would happen if every seven days we turned around like God did to look at the work of our hands over the last six days and we asked the question, is it good? And if it's not, what needs to change? Listen, if we reflected every week, I'm firmly convinced of this, that most of our issues would not be our issues because we would catch them on day seven instead of on year seven. Right? Come on. Because we don't live a life of reflection. And what happens is uh, a seven days of not reflecting, you know, leads to 14, leads to 21, leads to a month, leads to a year, leads to five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And then you turn 50, turn around and look at how off your life is. And you're like, how in the world did I get here? And you have a midlife crisis and buy a Corvette. <laughs> because that's what people do, right? Because they never reflect. But God has a gift for you and it's called Shabbat. And we need to learn to say yes to rest so that every seventh day we stop, we take a breath, we connect back to God, connect back to our family so that we ensure that our families are healthy. And then we turn around and we look at the last six days and we say, was it good? And if not, I got six more days moving ahead that I can tweak that and I can go back to center line. Okay, this, this is how life has to work. Listen, a few, uh, like not this last week, but the week before, uh, I was on a seven day mission trip. Okay, I was on a seven day, if you ever been on a mission trip, you're tired when you get back, okay? So seven day mission trip, I came back and now I'm, I'm writing sermon for the weekend and then my nephew's in from out of town and then Friday evening, I'm trying to, I have to do Ford week and I'm speaking there and Saturday morning, Summer and I wake up and we come down and speak again uh, down here and then we drive back up. I finish the sermon and I preach it that Saturday evening then right after that, I have to write a vow renewal ceremony that I was doing Sunday afternoon after I preached several times again. Have you ever been crispy? You know what I'm talking about? Like, like you're like, that you're about, no, I need some rest, right? And, and now here's what, it would ha I had a choice. I had a choice. Either I can just keep going and the cycle of exhaustion just spins up and it keeps going, keeps going. Or on Monday, I can stop. So you know what I did? I threatened the staff, don't you dare call me. <laughs> don't text me. You can, you can email me. I don't care. Listen, if you check email on your day off, it's your fault. It's your fault, man. So you know what I did on Monday? I did the craziest thing. This is gonna blow your mind. I took my phone and I turned it off. Some of you were like, does it even have that button? I'm like, what? <laughs> I turned it off and I left it at home and I left. And I opened up the door and the birds were chirping. <laughs> the sky was blue. And five minutes later, I started worrying, what are people eating? I don't know, how, I can't see pictures of people's food. <laughs> what birthday party am I missing? I don't know, what, what is Trump doing now? I don't know. <laughs> it was crazy, I, I'm still here. And the Sabbath, here's the idea for the Sabbath. Listen, it's to remind you that you didn't make the world and it's still gonna be here tomorrow when you wake up. That's the Sabbath. I have to say yes to rest. So why do I Sabbath? I Sabbath in Exodus because God Sabbathed. Because God worked for six days and then he rested. Here's, here's the second reason, okay? Why do, I, why, why do we Sabbath? Deuteronomy 5.12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Then he says the rest. But why? Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. But the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Here's what God's saying. He's saying, listen, slaves don't get a break. Slaves work seven days a row. They work the hours that their slave master tells them to. They're always available to their slave master. 
Listen, when the slave master comes knocking, they have to answer. But here's what God says. I set you free, and you're not a slave any longer. And a lot of us are like, yeah, you're right, I'm not a slave. Let me ask you a question. When was the last day you took an entire day, 24 hours, and you did not check email? You did not respond to a text. You didn't answer a phone call. You didn't get on social media. Some of you are like, I I don't know when the last time was. Well, God says today that you're a slave. But you don't have to be because God sets you free. God sets you free and you can step away from it. And listen, it'll still be there when you come back tomorrow, but today is a present and it's called Shabbat. All right, let, let, me, let me give you this and we'll close here. Understanding the Sabbath. This is kind of increasing ways, deeper ways, of, deeper revelation of, of the Sabbath, three steps. Here's the first one, is rest from your work. Rest from your work. We got this one, right? We understand it. But here's, here's the tricky thing about this, is that a lot of us work like the Monday through Friday thing. Maybe that's, you have the, the traditional job. Uh, but then you save all this other stuff that you have to do for Saturday and Sunday. All right, here, here's the thing. What did God tell the people to do? He said, Monday through Friday, all right, gather enough for today. Saturday, do twice as much so you can rest on Sunday. What would happen? You say, oh, I got all the errands, I gotta vacuum this, and I gotta do all that stuff, I gotta do all these things. What would happen if you did everything else that you were gonna do today, but you did it yesterday? I'll tell you what would happen. You'd be like, oh, I'm so tired at the end of Saturday. But Sunday, you would wake up and be like, what am I, I don't, I don't have anything to do. I don't, it's wonderful, right? Rest from your work. Here's the second thing, a little deeper. This is a very Hebrew understanding, is rest from even the thought of work. Different, right? How many of you know it's possible to be working but not be working? You ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're there but they're not there because their mind's somewhere else, right? Their mind's already at work. Their mind's doing something else and they're right in front of you. Um, We need to learn the power of saying no even when the thoughts come up. I, I, I've had to train myself to do this. Summer and I, we still catch ourselves doing this. Um, it, it's hard. It's really difficult at first because you're, you we're so programmed to think about work, 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 work. But the gift is this. On that day off, whatever day it is for you, I can tell myself, no, I'm not going to think about it. It's going to come up. Nope. Just keep pushing it down. Learn the power of saying no. And then over time, it becomes easier so that on that day, you, don't, you eventually don't even think about it. All right? And here's the highest form of understanding of the Sabbath. Rest as if all your work was done. In other words, every Sabbath, when you wake up, it's like it's the first day of your retirement. (sighs) Right? You wanna know why so many people, they just collapse uh, on a vacation, right? Um, Is because they never Sabbath. Like the first three days of vacation is just you sleeping. (laughs) Because you don't understand that God has a vacation for you every single week. You get a one-day vacation every single week. And some of you are like, I don't know, how would I pay my bills? I don't know, how would I be able to do all that sort of stuff? Sabbath is about trust, all right? Sabbath, I believe this, that like tithing is believing I can do more with 90% and God than 100% by myself, that the Sabbath is believing I can do more with six days in God than seven days by myself. I don't know, how would I do it all? Listen, just go and talk to (laughs) Chick-fil-A. They're doing all right. I think they're gonna make it, right? Because here's what I found out. When you do life God's way, it works. It works. Life becomes sustainable, right? There's a rhythm to life. Every seven days, you Sabbath. There's a rhythm to that. It's sustainable. What would happen if you lived the next seven years like you've lived the last seven days? Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Would you still be here or would you be amped up on medications? I believe this, that a lot of us are medicated for things that we could Sabbath for. But we never slow down. We never stop. And we have this mentality, right, that the Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that we don't have to do anymore. Right? Like, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't lie. Like, don't have any other gods before me. But the Sabbath, oh, Jesus set me free from that one, brother. (laughs) And that's why we're dying. Because we're not doing life God's way. But when we do life God's way, it works. And I believe this. Even in the land that we live in, 
Listen, if we can learn to trust in God's provision, if we can learn the power of saying no, and if we can learn to say yes to rest, that even in this land, we can overcome exhaustion. For the glory of Jesus, amen. 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 Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Jesus, oh, we love you, God. I thank you for the gift of rest. We live in a world that's moving a million miles an hour, but the good news today is we don't have to. <laughs> we don't have to try and keep up with the Joneses. We can trust in your provision. God, we're not a slave to people's expectations. And God, I thank you for this present called Sabbath. It's a gift. So today we say yes to rest. Here's what Jesus says. He says that I am the vine and you're the branches. He says, if you abide in me, if you remain in me, then my life will course through into you and you will bear much fruit. But if you, if you disconnect yourself, you can't do anything. So here's what we do today. Father, we, we, we slow our lives down and we reconnect to Jesus. In fact, here's what Jesus says in Matthew 11. Just allow me to, to speak it over you. Here's the words of Jesus. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? I think we would answer yes. And he says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. So here's what we do today, Father. I acknowledge that many of our lives are like a car going 100 miles an hour down the interstate, but that car needs some work done on it, and you can't work on a moving car. So today, even in the next few minutes, here's what we do. We take our foot off the gas pedal, we stop thinking about all the things we have to do, and we come to a stop, we pop the hood, and right now we're gonna allow Jesus access to fix us. So let's just take the next minute or two here. Let's just pause, stop, rest, reflect, and let's Sabbath in Jesus.